Afternoon VC, Jamie here. Hope you guys are all doing well. So apologies up front. <clears throat> You're probably gonna be able to hear that I have a fair bit of a cold at the moment. So tea in hand, um, <clears throat> gonna do my best not to completely cough and splutter through this. But anyway, day at home, time with some records. So I thought I would jump on and share a few things that I've been listening to. So kick off here with Great records from the Japanese keyboard player Masabumi Kikuchi. Uh, this is from 1970 on the Philips label. Um, and uh, this is his record Pusan, uh, which I think is uh, possibly his, uh, no, it's not his, it's not his debut um, as a soloist, uh, but it's one of his earliest records anyway. Um, and this, like a lot of Kikuchi stuff at this time, many of the Japanese musicians um, is very, very heavily in influenced by the music of Miles Davis around the same sort of time. Um, you can probably hear in the background at the moment this piece, Dancing Mist. It's very in the vein of some of the more up-tempo parts of the In a Silent Way sessions and the Phila de Kilimanjaro record, Miles in the Sky, that sort of stuff that was circulating. Um, and yeah, great album this. Um, lots and lots of interaction between the kind of dual um, keyboards, electric pianos, um, Kikuchi in one channel, and then Hideo Ichikawa on the other, um, Kosuke Mine on soprano, uh, who's fantastic as always, uh, and uh, the great Motohiko Hino on drums, uh, along with Hiroshi Murakami, so dual drummers as well. Um, so yeah, if you like the sort of 70s Miles sound, um, this is definitely one to check out. I'm not sure if it's been reissued recently. Um, may not have been actually, but um, most of this stuff is on YouTube um, and it's well, well worth checking out. Uh, Mention as well for a piece on the second side called Yellow Carcass in the Blue, which is all acoustic. Um, and that is a really like stunning, haunting uh, ballad. Uh, Kikuchi does a number of versions of that, as he does with uh, Dancing Mist on here as well. Um, but this is kind of, I think, the definitive one for me. So yeah, well worth checking out this um, Pusan uh, by Masamumi Kikuchi. So um, I'm going to continue here and I'm going to keep doing what I did briefly for my uh, last video, which didn't actually, you know, my camera that I was using before kind of cut off. So um, I'm gonna try again here uh, and see if I can make it all the way through uh, with my phone this time uh, and do needle drops to some extent. So um, yeah, continuing with the kind of 70s um, Miles influence stuff, uh, one on ECM here from the guitarist uh, Terje Riptal, uh, Norwegian. Um, this is a double album that he put out called Odyssey. Um, what year was this? 75. Um, and this definitely has a lot of the hallmarks of <clears throat> the stuff that you were hearing on the likes of um, Get Up With It, um, with that kind of organ drone you can hear. Uh, very heavy electric guitar too. Rick Dow's an, uh, one who's always been uh, very open that his guitar playing is as much rock and uh, to some extent classical influences it is anything to do with jazz. He's got a really aggressive tone, played a Telecaster most of the time, which is definitely not the norm for so-called jazz musicians. Um, but this is a, it's a great, super heavy record. Um, what you're hearing just now in the background is a piece um, called Rolling Stone, um, which like a lot of the longer tracks on here is, a, as I say, a double LP. Um, and every side has at least one 10 minute track on them. This one, Rolling Stone's about 23. Um, and it sticks in this kind of vamp most of the way through. Um, yeah, it's kind of hypnotic. Um, there's another one on here uh, as well called Midnight, which I really, really love. Um, it kind of, it's almost like in slow motion. It, it moves so, so slowly. Um, it's a late night track, midnight, but it really is one to listen to late at night. 
um, yeah, really cool stuff. And quite an interesting lineup on this as well in terms of instrumentation. You've got Riptal on uh, guitar. He also plays soprano a little as well. And it's kind of not so well known that he was also a saxophone player. Um, drums, bass, electric bass, organ, and then trombone is the only horn. So you get this uh, like deep uh, kind of vocalese quality from it. Um, but yeah, it's a cool one. Um, I really, really like it. Uh, it kind of meanders a little bit at times. It's not the most focused album. Um, but I, you know, I don't mind that. Not everything has to be a concise, focused statement. Um, sometimes it's good just to listen to someone kind of explore and figure out what direction they're going in, which is, I think, very much the vibe here. Um, so yeah, if you dig those Electric Miles records of the mid seventies, especially, this will definitely be up your street. Um, Odyssey, Turge Ripped Out. Um, so. Gonna do a bit more ECM here, um, and just excuse me while I s switch over the records. So, um, ECM is this kind of, there's been plenty of videos about um, ECM, uh, specifically lots of people sharing ECM records that don't sound like ECM records, uh, or you know, 10 albums to get into the label, that sort of thing. Um, and it's true to some extent, I think that it's a label that's not, I mean, for me, I, I love it. I, I think it's uh, actually a way more diverse label than, than people give it credit for. Um, but, uh, I've kind of lost my train of thought here as I'm changing this record over. Um, yeah, this is a this is a record that, that frequently appears in, in these sort of videos of, of ECM records to check out. Uh, for for skeptics of the label, um, that's definitely one that I whole, wholeheartedly agree with. Um, this is Michael Nara's Vanessa. Um, he's a Swiss pianist, um, and uh, yeah, this has a again a really really interesting, unusual lineup. So you got Wolfgang Sch uh, Schluter on vibraphone and marimba, who's kind of one of the dual lead voices. I think Nara's more of a supportive player on this on his electric keyboard. Um, Eberhard Weber on bass, who's got that really, really distinctive singing quality with his playing, loves the upper register, he plays a sort of electric acoustic hybrid bass, it's very, very distinctive. Um, and then Joe Ney on drums, but the real uh, kind of curveball instrumentally on here is um, Klaus Thunemann, who plays bassoon. Um, I didn't find that on Apple Music. Oh, that's weird. Don't wear a smartwatch, folks. <laughs> um, yeah, the the curveball here, as I say, is is um, is close to the on bassoon, and uh, this track here is, is the the lead track off side one, Salvatore. Um, I love it. it's again a sort of late night vibe, um, and it really sounds like this kind of dark presence is emerging from a mist. It sort of slowly creeps out of the fog at you, um, and then the drums come in much heavier. Uh, and you have the, as so you near the vibraphone playing this sort of like circular vamp underneath. Um, but yeah, on paper, this is, I mean, this is, like, you should bassoon as a, as an instrument in this kind of electric or electroacoustic lineup kind of sounds a bit bizarre. Um, but it works. Um, it works as a lead voice, um, with melodies, but it's a, it really interesting sound as a solo instrument on here as well. Um, and uh, yeah, Thuneman's not afraid to kind of let rip a bit more. He really pushes the the upper register and the kind of outer boundaries of the instrument um, right to almost breaking point, uh, overblowing and stuff. And I think it sounds really, really great. Um, yeah, so there's some more kind of jazz funk elements in here at times as well. Uh, Black Pigeon on side two, which I think sounds Awesome. Again, jazz funk with bassoon. It sounds like it sounds like a sort of spinal tap kind of thing. Just a little bit absurd. Excuse me, but it's it's really not. Uh, I think it's awesome. Um, so, yeah, one that's been shared plenty for people um, uh, by people rather who um, are showcasing alternatives on the label. As I say, wholeheartedly support it. Um, and as a more general thing. 
never ever write off ECM. Um, it's a label with too many great musicians and still tons and tons of albums that people have not really paid much attention to. I mean, the, the, the scope of their discography now is kind of ridiculous. Um, so yeah, don't, don't dismiss it and certainly pay zero attention to those who tell you that there is one kind of singular ECM sound because that is categorically nonsense. Um, it's very, very diverse um, and well worth your time. So uh, yeah, that's Michael Nero's Vanessa. Um, let me just put away this Ripdell record. Okay, here's a fun one. Uh, a bit more British jazz. Um, and sadly, uh, Davis left a comment on my last video, a kind of um, aborted attempt at a longer look at British jazz uh, by asking for some other recommendations of of British jazz albums to listen to, um, and he gave me the caveat that they had to be relatively cheap. Um, unfortunately, this is not one of those records, uh, and I'm not saying that as a um, a boast or a brag or anything like that, but actually it's more a general reality of the state of the the state of the um, of British jazz albums and how infrequently they've been reissued. I say infrequently, most of them have never been reissued. And even the originals had really, really limited runs. Um, this uh, came out on one of the more kind of commercial labels at the time, uh, Vertigo, obviously home of the likes of Black Sabbath. Um, also the jazz rock group Nucleus, who a lot of people will be familiar with. But even then, this, this album has not had a reissue that I'm aware of, apart from maybe once on CD since it came out. Um, so this was uh, recorded 1971, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, yeah, Keith Tippett Group, with the amazingly titled Dedicated to You But You Weren't Listening. Um, uh, Tippett was kind of really interesting, straddling, like, uh, free jazz, um, jazz rock, some more classical uh, world musics, really pioneering, um, pioneering free jazz musician over here. Um, played a lot with um, the uh, kind of South African expats that were around in the music at the same time. Chris McGregor, he appears in that great Chris McGregor of Brotherhood of Breath album. Um, Louis Maholo as well, um, his great Spirits Rejoice album. And he was also the man behind uh, the group Centipede, which is like a kind of ridiculous project that he did um, that had 50 odd musicians playing simultaneously. You know, you had like five drummers, eight bass players, massive horn section, three pianos. It was all about kind of scale of sound. Um, but yeah, this album here, 71, features him with a pretty large horn lineup that includes Elton Dean and Robert Wyatt, of course, who went on to be part of Soft Machine. Um, and it is kind of like free jazz meeting with um, Soft Machine. Um, there's elements of uh, Mingus, a um, little bit of like George Russell, some of the more interesting ends of Gil Evans arrangements as well. Um, yeah, it's a really, really cool record. Um, gets pretty out there and wild at times. Um, but it's 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 well worth a listen this um yeah i mean this one that we've got on in the background now is called green and orange night park um and i've always thought this was a bit of a nod to to mingus this one um orange was her black uh, orange was her dress uh blue silk um you can kind of hear the soft machine vibe in there a little bit Yeah, so and that's Elton Dean out front, which maybe adds to that as well. Um, I'll maybe jump it forward a little bit. So you've got like Dean wailing out front there, and then the rest of this horn section doing this call and response with them. 
Wyatt just like tumbling away on the drums there. Actually, I think Robert Wyatt on this is some of his best drumming. Ah, so good, it's like multiple drums. Uh, yeah, wailing sax. British, British experimental jazz at the best, really. Um, but yeah, sadly this is not a super cheap one. It's gotten really, really expensive over the years, I hope. This is the kind of stuff that needs to get reissued. I will say there are some, there is a project that's just uh, appeared um, by, um, sort of spearheaded by Tony Higgins who did the J Jazz compilations, um, which a few of you guys are, excuse me, probably familiar with these ones, uh, which he, he did um, a couple of years ago. Um, these are excellent, really worth checking out, but he's he's just done a new series, he started a new series called British Jazz Explosion, uh, where he's managed to get Decca, who now own most of the tapes for a lot of these classic sessions, to start putting out and do high quality um, reissues of, which I have a couple of uh, here, I'm not going to talk about them in too much detail just now, um, but uh, here's one here. Um, new Jazz Orchestra, um, Le Dejeuner uh, Sur L'Herbe, it's definitely not how you pronounce it, um, <clears throat> but this has like the who's who of British jazz on it, it's 68, um, kind of large orchestra, uh, who's on here, Har Harry Beckett, Ian Carr, Mike Gibbs, um, Dick Hextel Smith, Neil Ardley, Jack Bruce, um, yeah, Amazing arrangement of culture. And do you know what? I'm actually just going to put this on now I'm here talking about it. Um, yeah, great version of Coltrane's Naima, um, which is like amazingly orchestrated. Um, and also a great version of Dusk Fire, um, the Michael Garrick track, um, which that's actually perfect timing. Yeah, the Michael Garrett track, which appears as part of the Ian Carr Don Rendell album, of the same title. There we go. Um, so yeah, this is um, well worth a look. There's this and um, Don Rendell's Spacewalk, uh, which I have an original of, which uh, is definitely worth listening to as well. And also... Uh, some Kenny, uh, Kenny Wheeler, John Dankworth uh, records. Um, I'm not 100% sure if I've got it right here in front of me to pull out. No, can't find it. But anyway, that's that's worth looking at too. Um, so not many cheap British jazz records. However, this this reissue program that's just uh, just started, I think, offers a bit of hope that we're going to be able to get our hands on more of these iconic sessions um, at an affordable price because really they are, as I sort of alluded to in that short video a couple of months ago, they are musically up there with any of the stuff that was being made in America at the time. And sonically, they're just, they're different. They occupy a different kind of musical language, slightly different space, um, but they're um, still full of great musicianship. Um, and uh, yeah, I think more people should be more people should be listening to them. Um, okay, what else have I got here? Uh, here's one. Um, cool Geo record. This one. Um, this is uh, pianist Amina Claudine Myers uh, and the drummer Farween Aklaf. Song for Mother E. Um, and this was on Leo Records. Uh, 1980 um, and uh, yeah this this is an album that uh, on on paper sounds like it could be sonically a little bit messy and maybe messy is not the right word um, like lacking music like drums piano is maybe missing a bit of kind of low end in there um, organ as well, but what um, what um, I mean, Colleen Myers does really well is that she utilizes the left hand um, quite heavily, so it brings up a lot of the bottom end of the 
of the bass. Um, and then you've got a clef as well, who's actually really orchestrating on the drum kit. Uh, it's not very much not a case of him just playing rhythm. Um, he's he's playing, you know, uh, very very musically and expressively. Um, this is sort of uh, there's quite I get quite a bit of a Stanley Cowell vibe off her on this album for some reason. Um, can't quite put my finger on why. Um, but yeah, def definitely Stanley Cow element on here. Um, this one's called 3 4 is a 4 4. Um, alternates between 3 4 and 4 4. Um, you also have the opener here, um, I'm Not Afraid, which gives you a better idea of what I was talking about with the left hand and, and the claps drumming style using the toms a lot more heavily. Her records are. I was having a look recently. She did. A, she did a couple of others um, around this time. One that was a tribute to Bessie Smith, and another one that's like a solo piano um, interpretation of Marion Brown's music, which I've been looking for that one for a long time. Uh, just don't find copies of it here in the UK at all. Um, really, really hard to get hold of. But I love Marion Brown's compositions and her her playing. You can hear. I think you can hear the the Stanley Cowell thing a bit more here. Reminds me a little of uh, his trio record on ECM. And also actually his amazing solo piano record on Strata East. Um, yeah, echoes of that to me. But this is cool. This is cool. Song for Mother E. Um, pretty cheap as well. And I, this copies of this pop up quite a lot. Um, so I, that's a recommendation. I, I really enjoy that one. I think it's worth checking out. Excuse me. Um, let's see what else. Here's a horrible cover, <laughs> but uh, some great music contained inside. Um, saxophonist Pat Brett, um, Star Song on uh, Catalyst Records. Um, I think Catalyst was his label. Um, Pretty sure he was behind it. Um, either that, or he was like A and R for it, or something. Um, but this is this is like a classic, classic seventies uh, cheap, great acoustic jazz session. Uh, nothing super fancy, nothing uh, too showy or show offy, but you've just got great, great playing. Um, like this one here, opening up, title track. You know, modal vibe, swinging hard, um, slightly Latin influenced drumming, pretty muscular bass. Um, yeah, this is a lot of what I look for in, in 70s kind of acoustic jazz. Um, yeah. Some great shots and musicians inside here as well. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, there's some good stuff on Catalyst actually. Um, a couple of great Hadley Kalman records, um, which also are pretty cheap, although I think prices on those are starting to creep up a bit now. Um, as to be honest, is happening with all, all jazz vinyl, right? I think we've all been noticing since the pandemic 18 months ago. Prices have just kind of gone stratospheric, especially Blue Note stuff. I mean, God, I'm kind of watching with mild terror the price of some, not, e I mean, not even original pressings, uh, not even Liberty pressings, actually. Um, you know, stuff like uh, even the, the, the like 80s direct metal master stuff is now going for like 30, 40 pounds. Just don't get it, like crappy 80s reissue. Um, I mean, just wait for, most of them are gonna be reissued in this classic series anyway, I would think, which is sonically so much better. It's just, yeah, I don't really get it. It's that notion that somehow, just because the pressing's older, it's somehow worth more money. I mean, I get it for, for second pressings or stuff, some of the original tapes, but if you're buying those eight those those eighties pressings, if you're spending 
I just, yeah, I don't get it. Um, but anyway, there's still plenty of super great cheap stuff out there. Uh, that pepper is one of them. Here's another one. Um, I've seen this shared a couple of times recently over on Instagram. Uh, I managed to pick one up from a um, British seller down south who was selling it for I think five or six quid. Um, this is great. Harold Land's Blue Mitchell, uh, Mapenzi, um, also features uh, Kirk Lightsey on piano. Uh, Reggie Johnson on bass and Albert Tootie Heath on drums. Um, there's a what you're listening to just now is it's kind of my pick off the album. It's Lightsey's um, piece Habiba, um, which he also recorded I think the year before this. This was '75. Um, '74 he recorded one with Rudolph Johnson, um, who he was the pianist for on, on Johnson's Black Jazz records. Um, but it's Kurt Lightsey's, uh, I think his debut solo record, and it has a version of Habiba on it that's more electric than this. And it's like 20 odd minutes long. It was just reissued last year. It's great too, but I, um, I think I prefer the version on this. Uh, the kind of brevity, I think, helps it. 20 minutes is a bit too long, um, at least for that track. Um, but yeah, this is great. I mean, if you know some of the musicians on here, you know what to expect. Land, obviously, some fantastic solo records, um, especially his mainstream stuff in the early 70s, um, and Peacemaker on Cadet. Um, Reggie Johnson, fantastic bass player. Um, plenty of stuff with Bobby Hutcherson worth checking out. There was actually a slight echoes of the, of the Hutcherson bands around this period uh, on this album, um, but yeah, Land and Mitchell together, great. This is the first time I think they'd ever recorded together. Uh, they formed a band for like a year um, and they're great. Uh, they sound great. Um, yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't really go wrong with musicians of this caliber at that price. Um, yeah, great stuff. Uh, and actually on that, it was one I had earlier that I wasn't gonna show, but now I've mentioned it. This, I've been playing a fair bit. Uh, Eddie Marshall, Dance of the Sun. Um, and this has got the Hutchison connection. Bobby Hutchison appears on this as well. Um, and to be honest, Marshall, though he's the leader and the drummer, it's, it could easily be a Hutchison record. Most of these guys are in Hutchison's band at the same time. It's the, exactly the same lineup that's on his, um, on Hutchison's album, Waiting, uh, on Blue Note, um, that has that great version of Search in the Train. Um, and it's exactly in that same wheelhouse of that kind of bright, sunny LA sound. Um, not lightweight, uh, not musically lightweight, but kind of buoyant, bouncing. Um, yeah, I'm gonna chuck this on. There's a couple of there's there's a couple of tracks on here, especially that are are worth hearing. One is the um, one is the uh, opening track, uh, which is called High Priestess of Gone. Um, which I'll throw on quickly. Uh, the other is a frankly like ridiculous version of um, Salt Peanuts, um, which I don't think I've I don't think I've ever heard a version that fast. Uh, even even some of the earlier uh, Dizzy and Bird versions, uh, they don't they don't come anywhere near in terms of the tempo and the the freneticism of it. I think part of that's kind of amplified by the, the kind of frantic, uh, really muscular drum sound on here that Eddie Marshall's got as well. It has that, this whole record has got that um, sort of electric uh, fusion approach to acoustic drum miking that you find a lot in 70s records, um, where, you know, someone's playing on a jazz kit. It's the Tony Williams influence, right? It's jazz drumming, but on this, this big kind of rock fusion kit, um, and everything is just amped up, like 120%. So this is High Priestess of Gone. You see what I mean about that kind of light, airy quality? Um, I have no idea how long I've been going on for now, by the way. If anyone's still watching, cheers to you. 
but yeah, it's just High Priestess of Dawn. Great stuff. Uh, here's Salt Peanuts though. Here we go. Bit silly. <laughs> it's good though, right? When I saw it, yeah. I mean, when I saw this on the uh, on the album cover, I uh, on the rear of the cover, I thought uh, this might be one I'm going to skip over. Quite often, find that covers on albums like this are a bit especially in the 70s, uh, they can get a bit... Uh, they're usually the weakest points of the record, let's put it that way. Um, this is maybe the highlight, though. I mean, Hutchison is just next level. So, as I say, wasn't planning on showing that, but uh, that's Eddie Marshall, Dance of the Sun. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe maybe one more and then I'll call it because I must have been going at least half an hour now. Um, this is one that, uh, very different to what we're just listening to. Um, excuse my cold. However, this is a really, really, really special session. Um, was uh, originally recorded in 1996 um, in, uh, Morocco and uh, let me just throw that on right now. The salt peanuts accompaniment doesn't quite do service to this amazing album. So this is, uh, as you may have seen, fantastic um, giant Pharaoh Sanders with um, Malim Mahmoud Ghania, um, who kind of the master of Gnawan music, um, which is this um, traditional Moroccan music, um, all based around these uh, metal, like metal castanets. Um, and this sort of um, bass-like instrument, uh, I'm now completely blanking on the name of it, which is really, um, ignorant of me, Gumbiri, there we go, thank you. Um, and it's a very communal music, it's ritualistic. Um, traditionally it was performed as part of a, a ceremony with large groups, uh, usually at night. Um, and it's, the band is often made up of, of family members in, in, these, in these groups, um, traditionally that nomadic, um, um, nomadic people. Um, and so <clears throat> what you have here is a session in 1996, Bill Laswell, the producer, goes out to Morocco um, with um, some recording equipment and uh, is accompanied by Pharaoh Sanders. And they set up in the courtyard of Malim Mahmoud Ghania's um, large family communal home and over a period of a couple of days, they record this amazing spontaneous music fusing Pharaoh's really soulful spiritual playing with this kind of primal music. Um, and yeah, I don't really know how to describe this properly other than it's, to me, kind of essential listening for everybody, actually. It says, oh, if you like this, you should try this. I really think everyone should listen to this. It's rhythmically so, so interesting. I mean, you've got, um, I mean, you can hear influences there on, I mean, think of what you just heard there. It's like something off Steve Reich, um, that, you know, that repetition, the cross rhythms, the polyrhythms. There's elements of almost like Detroit techno on this, um, sonically too. Um, it's just, 
it connects to something really fundamental, I think. If you, you can take some time and put this on and turn all the lights off in the room you're in and just sit with it. Um, and yeah, to hear this, this dialogue between two cultures, such uh, respect um, and joy and I don't know, I find it a very hopeful record to listen to. Um, yeah, I won't say much more about it than that, but please seek this out. It's called The Trance of Seven Colours. Um, as I say, originally re uh, released in 96 on cassette. It's had a vinyl reissue recently. Um, track it down if you haven't, uh, and if you can't find a copy, then for God's sake, just listen to it online somewhere. Um, beautiful, amazing music. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that will, that will definitely do it. No idea how long I've gone on for. I'm surprised my throat has made it through. Um, yeah, so thanks for sticking with me. Um, that was a bit random and informal, but it's kind of fun. Um, so I hope you guys are all doing well um, and uh, hopefully I won't leave it so long for the next one. So until next time, uh, yeah. Take care and look after yourselves. Cheers.